Hello everyone, thank you for calling in. Uh, today I would like to present a couple of methods to deal with uh, field stresses when doing numerical modeling. Uh, basically one where we can control the stresses by deformations on the boundary and another one to deal with in situ stress measurements. Let's start by uh, looking at uh, the method that deals with boundary deformations uh, in order to control the stresses. You might be asking yourself, uh, why do I really want to control the stresses uh, by boundary deformations? Uh, there's, uh, there's a few reasons why you would like to do that. Um, for instance, uh, one could be a setting where you have several materials, several rock types, uh, like dikes and soft zones, and uh, they usually disturb the stress field. So to start a model with a uniform stress, stress field is, is not quite the right way. So what we do is we have a sense of the regional stresses and we will uh, apply deformations to the boundary to get an average field stress in the model. But in the process of that boundary squeeze, you end up picking up, picking up stress on the dikes and, uh, and shedding stress on, on fault zones and rotating stresses, etc. Another reason uh, would be uh, when you do a very large scale model and you're interested in uh, the stresses in a, a zone where you're going to uh, have uh, some infrastructure. And, but you can't really model the infrastructure because the model is too large and you don't have the resolution. So what you do is you run the large scale model and then you sample the stresses at the points of interest and you use those sample stresses as input for a much smaller, a more uh, refined model around the zones that you're interested in. To pick up on Trevor's discussion on stresses, you may recall these figures from his presentation. They show a mine setting where there are a couple of dikes and a few shears around the ore body, and it just shows how convoluted the in situ stress can be even before you start mining due to the fact that those stiff dikes have picked up a lot of stress and disturbed the stress field. Another example where you might want to capture the stress path to look at uh, infrastructure in a more detailed way is a block caving example. Uh, I'm showing here the level where you're going to develop uh, the extraction level for a block cave. And uh, the uh, rectangle that you see there highlighted in blue is where some infrastructure is going to happen and you want to capture the full stress path that happens in that particular location for a refined model. So pay attention to the stress block uh, at the top and how it changes and rotates as the, uh, as the cave advances. And on the uh, graph, you will see the magnitude of the stresses changes as, as, as the block cave advances. So all the infrastructure is, or some of it is built at this point. You can see the, you can see the, uh, the, the stress cave, the, sorry, the block cave uh, starting up and progressing. And look at the top block as it's rotating. Uh, the principal stress orientations are rotating and the magnitudes are increasing uh, as the cave approaches that area and sheds stress in front of it. So this is another example where you might capture the stress path and do a refined model in the area of interest. So let's look at what kind of information we're going to need to apply this uh, method. Uh, obviously, you're going to need the elastic properties of the rock mass. Because we're looking at the whole model, we need to get an average uh, set of properties for the whole model. If you have multiple materials, uh, we should weigh uh, have a weighted average of the material stiffnesses, or if you have a dominant material, just use that, that particular stiffness. Uh, the model itself needs to be an orthogonal block because we are going to apply deformations to opposite faces, whether we're squeezing, squeezing or shearing. And uh, the three dimensions do not need to be the same. It doesn't have to be a cube, but it does have to be orthogonal. And of course, you're gonna need the stress field that you're trying to generate in a model whether it is an initial stress field or if it is a, a stress path for which you're going to need uh, the stresses resulting from each, uh, each stage. If you're looking at a, an initial stress uh, tensor, you can, uh, you can use a gravitational stress tensor or any other tensor that, uh, that you have for the regional stresses. 
if you're looking at a stress path, then you're going to need a series of, of stress tensors, whether you capture the full stress tensor at each stage or whether you capture the first stress tensor and increments to that stage, it doesn't matter, but you're going to need the full stress path. And just a couple of definitions in here we're going to need, as I said, the, uh, the elastic properties of the rock mass, you're going to need that, and then the uh, dimensions of the model or the coordinates of the, uh, of the model so you can define the uh, length in the x, y, and z direction. Um, we're going to start dealing with stress tensors and strains and stresses, so uh, you're going to see a little bit of algebra coming up in the next uh, few slides. Here we have the relationship between the stresses and the strains given the stiffness of the medium, which is represented by the stiffness matrix that you see here. Uh, basically, uh, you need two elastic parameters to define this matrix. Notice that we have six components of uh, the strains and, and the stress, but in actuality there are nine components. Uh, be aware that the x, y, and the y, x components are equal in magnitude, but they do come in pairs. So we need to address all nine components when we define the deformations that we're going to apply to our model. Let's assume we have our model sitting in space uh, and the centroid of our model has coordinates uh, y, g, c, x, g, c, and z, g, c, which uh, are the coordinates of the centroid with respect to a global system. The reason I point this out now is because uh, if you're going to implement this system, for instance, in a flat 3D setting, uh, this will become important uh, just because of the way stress gradients and the deformation gradients are specified in, in FLAC. I would like to show you now how these deformations are going to be applied to the uh, sets of two faces, parallel faces, uh, in each one of these three directions. We'll start with the X face, and this is the only face that I'm going to show you. All the other ones will be the same uh, or follow the same procedure. So this is the first strain, EXX, when it's applied across the x direction is going to compress the uh, model, and uh, in order to do that, you're going to require a displacement du, which is the strain multiplied by that length of the model. Because we like to keep the centroid in the same place all the time, we apply half of that deformation on each one of the sides, the low side and the high side. So we'll apply half du, as it's shown here. Uh, that should deform the block in, in the fashion that you see here. Notice that for this particular strain, the whole face deforms the same amount, so it's a constant displacement on that face that is normal to the face. The next two strains that also result in constant deformation on the X face, meaning the whole face moves the same way, uh, are the UIX and the EZX. And uh, the shapes of the deformed block are shown here on, on the left and the right. So you multiply that strain again by the dx, by the uh, length of the model in the x direction, and they result in the deformations or displacements into the y direction and the z direction that the x face is going to have to undergo. Again, keeping the centroid in the center, half of the displacement is applied to one face and the other half to the other face in opposite directions. The next uh, six strains actually cause a gradient of deformation across the face. So you can see the deformed shapes of the blocks due to the EXY and the DXZ strains. And uh, we are now have to apply a linearly varying deformation to the faces of the blocks. And again, uh, for the EYY and the EYZ strains, the same thing happens. Uh, the blocks are deformed in a way that on the left side the X face actually gets compressed from either end uh, and uh, it gets tilted on, on the right figure. And for the last two strains the same thing happens. The uh, deformed shape on the left side shows uh, the X face being deformed in shear and then on the right figure you have the uh, X face is being compressed toward the center in the Z direction. So that was an interesting way of showing how the block is going to be deformed. 
uh, in a graphical way so people understand what we're doing to the model. But at the end of the day, all you need to do is apply the displacements to the uh, faces, the pairs of faces. Remember, this is only for the X face. Uh, you apply displacements on the lower face and the upper face. And uh, these uh, six displacements are represent the constant uh, deformation of the faces. So the whole face is moving the same way. And these uh, six pairs of uh, deformations uh, are the gradients on the X faces. So you have to apply a linearly varying uh, deformation to each face according to uh, the strains shown in here. Having done that, uh, if you apply them all at the same time it, to the model, you'll end up with a stress state that you intended to have uh, from the beginning. Just a couple of notes for FLAC uh, users. Um, the way you apply gradients uh, to the faces of, of a model in FLAC, uh, whether they're stress or, or deformation, displacement, uh, you don't have to calculate the displacements themselves. You can you can uh, inform the code what the gradient itself is. So all you need to enter in the code in the gradient, gradient fields are the actual strains that you see here. So now I'm circling back to that first figure that I showed you. And the reason why you needed to keep the location of the centroid with respect to the global coordinate system, meaning the 0, 0, 0 coordinate. The gradients in FLAC are uh, applied uh, starting at the origin. So if you, the centroid of your model is far away from the origin, you're going to impart a stress or a strain to the block that you don't really want. So the uh, expressions highlighted in yellow uh, is what's going to bring everything back to normal. And you can see they're based on, they're based on the gradients that you applied in the previous slide. And you have to subtract the strains generated by that just to compensate for the fact that your model is not centered around the origin. So let's put this uh, method to, uh, to good use here. And I'm going to use the uh, stress path uh, example that I gave for the block caving example. And I generated a, a simple cube model with 64 elements, which I'm going to uh, apply the strains to, to generate the stress fields that we collected from from the larger model. Uh, you can see the uh, frame in red that you see uh, is the undeformed shape of the block. And all the contours are applied to the deformed shape of the block. Uh, the exaggeration here is about 50 times. So you can see uh, sigma xx uh, applied or um, uh, extracted from stage one for, for the block cave model. Uh, translated into strains and applied to the model result in the correct stress in the x direction. And then we can do the same for the y. You can check those. zz, xy, yz, and zx. So uh, it's uh, it's the same thing for the next stages. I'm going to flip through all 10 stages uh, of the stress path. And you folks keep an eye on the way that the block is deforming and the way that the stresses are rotating on that little stress block on the right. So here we have stage two. I'm not going to highlight each individual stress like I did on stage one. You folks just keep an eye on, on the way that the cube deforms as I flip through the stages. Stage three, stage four, stage five. Now, in the next stage, if you recall from the cave demonstration, uh, it, the stress is really increased in stage six and, and the stress block takes a good rotation. So keep an eye out for the next stage. Stage six. So if you were watching the stress block on the right, you could see that it went through a good rotation. The other thing that uh, was noticeable if you uh, were paying attention is the, the form shape of the block uh, changed quite a bit as well due to the increase in stress and the rotation of the stresses. And now the remaining stages, stage seven, stage eight, 
stage nine. The stress block is still rotating a little. And finally, stage 10. So a few things to remember and be careful. Uh, you've noticed from this example that the uh, displacement field uh, changes uh, across the block. We should have uh, virtually zero displacement in the center, but the boundaries have all moved in different orientations and created a, a displacement field in the block. This displacement field is just a result of, of the external squeeze. It has nothing to do with the problem you're going to, to solve, uh, and, and you need to correct for these. So um, you need to subtract the elastic displacements created by, by this method from the actual displacements that you will later compute during your actual uh, model or your actual excavation. Uh, the other thing to note is that all the boundaries of the uh, model need to be fixed in all directions because if your stress tensor contains shear components and you don't fix them in all directions and you just fix the normal directions of the model, then you're going to lose the shear stress in the model because uh, the model will be allowed to move. In any case, it's always uh, safer to fix the boundaries. They shouldn't affect anything because they should uh, be far away enough from your zone of interest uh, if you've uh, correctly sized the, uh, the model uh, domain. So if you are using this method for a simple application of the stress field, meaning trying to set up the correct stress field at the start of the model because of contrasting moduli in your geology, all you have to do after the application of the strains is you just zero the displacements and you are set to go. If we are using this for a stress path application, what you need to do is you need to solve for all the stress stages of your model without any excavations and record what the deformations or displacement field is at every stage for further correction of each stage once you run the actual model. So a little bit more work. The reason you need to run these without excavations is because you really just want to subtract that elastic movement from the squeeze of the solid block. This concludes the presentation of the method of applying boundary deformations to obtain a stress field, and we are going to change gears a little bit. If you recall the discussion by Trevor on moving from regional stresses to project stresses to excavation scale stresses, look at the slide in the background. He talked about the importance of getting these right. So let's talk about handling in situ stresses that might have been measured by a number of methods and how we can use a model to calibrate those measurements to a regional stress or a far field stress. These are some of the available stress measurement techniques out there. That's uh, by no means uh, an exhaustive uh, uh, selection, but uh, these are the most common. USPM cell, the whole inclusion cell from CSIRO, that's a 3D stress tensor measurement, the ENSI strain cell, also a 3D measurement, uh, and the SIGR tool, similar to the USBM cell. They both measure stress in two dimensions. And then you've got stress meters that you can install in boreholes on underground excavations to uh, look at the change in stresses as you advance an excavation or a mine. These tend to be one dimensional. One of uh, the challenges in the interpretation of these uh, measurements, especially on the ground, uh, where there are already excavations uh, uh, in the ground, uh, is that these in situ stress measurements are influenced by uh, the excavations around them, including the excavation that they are performed from. Uh, also, if, and if you measure stresses in the same excavation at different times because of changes in in uh, whether it is a mine or, or any other development, uh, they can change with time as well. And uh, the installation of stress cells, as I mentioned before, in response to mining progress uh, are very common and they provide stress changes. They can also be used to interpret stresses around you. So <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, what we can do with these stress measurements to interpret a regional stress tensor. Uh, without the influence of the excavations around them. We're going to need a few things to do this. Uh, first, we need a decent geological geomechanical model of the site because uh, you have to have good representation of what you're modeling. We need uh, the elastic parameters for the rock units for that particular model. Geometry and sequence of excavations if you're in a, in a dynamic environment in terms of, of changes in, in geometry.
the location and time of the stress measurements, that's uh, time with respect to excavation sequence, and of course, the stress measurements themselves. What we are going to try and do here is to estimate the regional or far field stress tensor such that when it is applied to the numerical model, it will produce stresses that match the in situ stress measurements at the location they were performed, or at least it will minimize the error in those stresses. In order to do that, we will have to decompose the stress tensor into its six Cartesian components. And again, we have to use Cartesian components so that in the end, we can add like stresses. We then run the model six times each time with a unit stress for each component separately. That means the same model geometry and a different stress field. This allows us to build an influence matrix representing the contribution from each unit component of the stress field, such that in the end, when we multiply this matrix by the regional stress estimate, we can obtain the measure stresses at each location of interest. To do this, we extract the stresses from the models for all the locations for which we have stress measurements. Again, this is going to require some algebra, so just bear with me. This matrix represents the results for each stress location. We have six models, each with one unit stress component loading the system, and then we extract the stress results, all six components, due to that load at the point of interest. So each row represents one of the measured components at the point of interest, the lower index, due to all six components low in the system, the upper index. So if we look at the matrix, we'll have the stress in the x direction, the lower index, due to the model that had a stress in the x direction applied to it uh, with a unit magnitude. Same thing on the second one, that's the stress in the x direction due to a model with a unit stress in the y direction, and so on. And then the second row represents the results for the stresses in the y direction due to each one of the components loading the system. This builds a full matrix for the point of interest that we can use later to estimate the actual stresses in the model. So after we extract the results for all the points of interest where we have the stress measurements from all six models with unit stresses applied to them, we assemble all location matrices into one large matrix representing all the data we have from our stress measurement campaign. This is a matrix with six times n rows, n being the number of locations where we took measurements, by six, which is the number of components in a stress tensor. So we have location one, location two, and so on up to location n. So we now are done with the hard work. If we call that large matrix, matrix J, what would we do with all this good information now? We uh, reach into our bag of statistical tools and choose the good old method of least squares to best fit all the data. Remember, we are after the regional or far field stress tensor. Let's call that tensor sigma KL. We still do not know what the values are, but once we know that, then all the different stress components at all the different locations are already available by multiplying the J matrix. Remember, this is the matrix results due to unit stresses by the tensor sigma KL. We now have our estimate of all the stress measurements from our numerical model, but we also have all the actual measurements taken in the field. That means that we can calculate the error between our estimates and the actual measurements represented here by the uh, symbol sigma star ij. The method of least squares says that we first need to sum the square of all the errors. We represent that by the expression you see on the screen. Note that we are summing the errors from all the stress components for all the locations. That is six times n pieces of information. The next step in the method of least squares is to minimize the sum of the errors. This is done by differentiating the sum of the error with respect to the variable of interest, in this case, our estimate of the regional stress tensor, sigma KL. And then 
equating that differentiated expression to zero. If we do that, we end up with the expression in the bottom of the screen after we expand the sums. All we have left to do now is to solve for sigma KL. Let's make our life a little easier and call the first matrix AIJKL. That expression in the square bracket represents the product of the transpose J matrix by the J matrix itself. Remember that the J matrix had dimensions of 6n by 6, so the product of the transpose by itself results in a 6 by 6 matrix. Similarly, the product of the transpose of the J matrix by the array of in situ stress measurements results in a 6 by 1 matrix. Let's call that matrix the GKL matrix. We now have our solution. What we would like to do next is to have a measure of how good the fit is. Since we employed a statistical technique, we should be able to measure the goodness of our fit. Let's define a couple of summations here. S1 is the sum of the square of all the components of all the in situ stress measurements. S2 is the sum of the square of all the components of our stress estimates at the same location as the in situ test. Therefore, S3 is the error sum of the squares. Using these definitions, we can now look at some meaningful numbers. The square of the multiple correlation coefficient R squared is given by the ratio of S2 on, N, on S1. The standard deviation about the regression line is given by the lower expression. This standard deviation by itself is not as useful as the standard deviations of the individual components of the stress tensor. The variance of the individual stress components of the stress tensor can be obtained by multiplying the square of the standard deviation about the regression line by the diagonal entries of the AIJKL matrix. Remember, we redefined this summation before. You can take a deep breath now. We're done with the algebra. You will see next that this is not so hard to implement. Uh, we're going to take a look at an example. Let's assume that we have an underground cavern where we drilled a number of boreholes to undertake the stress measurements. In order to demonstrate the method, I will have to make up some data. In order to do that, I made up a regional stress field and ran the analysis on the cavern on the program RS3 by Rock Science. This is the stress field I assume to be the real stress field for the site, with a major stress slightly off vertical. This is what it looks like on a stereo net. The dialog window on the top right is a field stress entry window in the program. These are the stress measurements from 24 in situ stress tests done from the cavern. I want you to forget the stress field I showed you in the previous slide. That is a stress field we will be trying to match based on the stresses in the boreholes. What I did after sampling the stresses in the location shown in the figure, I disturbed them slightly, plus minus 10%, so that my data set is not so perfect. So as I said, the only data we have are the measurements in these boreholes, and we will try to back out the regional stress field for the site. Using the same geometry and rock properties, we run the model six times, each time with an applied unit stress for each component of the stress tensor. These are the six dialog boxes with the unit stresses applied to each model. The normal stresses are easy to apply, shown on the top dialog boxes. In RS3, you have to define the stress field by the principal stresses. So to apply unit shear stress components, you have two sets of normal stresses in the opposite direction to achieve that, shown on the bottom dialog boxes. We are now ready to go and extract all the data from the models for all the locations of interest. You are going to see a couple of slides blasted with numbers. Ignore the numbers. The slides are just to demonstrate the large amount of information you are going to collect from the models. These are the J matrix components for each location sample. This page shows the stress tensors for all 24 locations due to unit normal components of the stress. And this page shows the stress tensors for all 24 locations due to the unit shear components of the stress. Recall that once we have all this data assembled into a J matrix, we can readily calculate the A and G matrices that will allow us to solve for the regional stress field. We are actually trying to match or minimize the error for 144 pieces of information, 24 locations with six stress components each. These are the resulting A and G matrices 
And after solving the system of six equations, which you can do quite easily in Excel, we now have an estimate of the regional stress field mission accomplished. These are the statistics of our best fit exercise. You can see the variance for each of the stress components. The multiple correlation coefficient R over here is 97%, quite a good fit. That's not surprising since I made up the perfect data and then disturbed it by about 10%. We can also calculate the principal stresses and their orientations from the Cartesian component stress tensor. So how did we do? Compare that with the actual regional stress field that I used to generate the data. The one that I asked you to forget in an earlier slide. Not too bad. We overestimated the principal stress magnitudes, a result of my disturbance of the data. As far as the orientations go, we are better off looking at those on a stereo net. This is the comparison between the orientations of the real stress field in green and the orientation of the estimated stress field in red. Notice that the orientations of the estimated stress field ended up a little rotated in comparison with the correct ones. Again, a result of my messing with the data to create an imperfect data set. So here we have a technique that allows you to create a defensible, statistically sound estimate of a regional stress field. On behalf of Trevor and myself, I would like to thank you all for attending this virtual seminar. Apologies for the bit of algebra I put you through, but it was unavoidable.